It's 16 minutes after 7. This is my Ellie Banner here on our show today. Uh, and I did mention that if you're a farmer, this is a conversation definitely for you. If you're interested uh, in, in farming as well, definitely a conversation for you. Uh, government is expected to be subsidizing fertilizer. Uh, but we had a report, Joseph Opokugapo, my colleague, put together a report from the central region where some farmers said that they were not enjoying you know, that uh, subsidy, even companies who supply fertilizer that government had uh, contracted to be supplying uh, are also getting out of that contract because they were not getting, you know, the monies from governments. But Sen Ghana has also done some research in northern Ghana. They've put together a report. I'm happy to say that the lead researcher in, in this uh, research is joining us for a conversation. He's also a programs officer with Sen Ghana. John Inko is my guest. Good morning to you. Good morning. Mm. So I'm very happy to be here. Sure. And good morning to our cherished listeners. Sure. Uh, let's get the background of this. Why did you decide, first of all, to uh, research into this? Yeah. Um, this research has been necessitated because Saint Ghana is a public research and advocacy organization. We go out into the public sector as an independent development organization to try to um, examine government policies, particularly the pro poor policies, such as the Government of Ghana uh, sub uh, Fertilizer Subsidy Program. We also go in to look at other programs such as the NHIS and Maternal Health. Mm. So basically the motivation has been to look at the fact that government has been implementing the Fertilizer Subsidy Program since 2008. And our interest is in looking at how the whole, the entire program has been, you know, functioning. What are the, what are the design and implementation issues that exist out there? And we also want to assess how the benefits has been to farmers in terms of their overall productivity and mm -hmm. income levels. So did you take the three northern regions? Yes. Um, um, the study was carried out in the three northern regions. Basically, because Sen has a lot of physical presence in the area, we have a lot of experience in working in the, in, in the northern Ghana. But more especially, that poverty statistics in the three northern regions are quite still high. And we want to examine, looking at how government's pro poor policies, such as the fertilizer subsidy, is impacting upon the lives of our people. Mm. Share your findings with us then. Yeah, the findings are very interesting. Um, Generally, the research looked at government allocations in terms of the quantum of uh, fertilizer, fertilizer in terms of the, the tonnage. We also went ahead to look at how much has government been spending overall in terms of, you know, the allocations that have been done. But of course, if you look at those analyses, you realize that government has been quite consistent since 2008, investing um, significantly in the sector. And that is very interesting. However, in 2014, government um, did not, or government could not, you know, spend on the subsidized fertilizer. And that definitely had some untold challenges uh, upon the smallholder farmer in the sense that they needed to go into the uh, marketplace to buy fertilizer at commercial rates. Mm. And so that raised a lot of challenges regarding their level of productivity. Because farmers then had to cut back, farmers then had to make some savings, and what that meant was that the large acreages they usually produce had to be reduced, and once you reduce the acreage, what that means is that your productivity is going to reduce and your income level is going to reduce. So that said about the allocations, we went ahead to look at the supply chain. And we realized that, or the findings of the study revealed, that government is the main funder of the fertilizer subsidy program. Um, it imports the fertilizer through the PPP, that is the public-private partnership. That is a lofty agenda of government. It's helping government to be able to remain consistent. But of course, it also has challenges because government then have to support the suppliers or the importers with import guarantees. That takes some considerable period of time. And because fertilizer it's a seasonal product. What that means is that there are delays occasioned by the 
uh, importation and that definitely has a tickle down effect mm -hmm. on the farmers because they sometimes don't get the fertilizer at the right time and the little evidence from the farmers quite indicate that it's a source of worry and they would want government to work towards that. But beyond that, we also have challenges of quality control because fertilizer is not an entirely homogeneous product. Mm. The soil, depending on the nature of the soil, there is a type of fertilizer that should go with it. But as it is now, the quality control sector is weak. Beyond that, we even cannot guarantee whether the fertilizer we are bringing in is entirely the quality one. Mm. And so there's the need, there are, there are quality assurance issues. Okay. Quite apart from that, we also have found out that issues of monitoring. Did you say monitoring w w on which of the parts? Yes, monitoring on the part of government. You know, because government has gone into partnership with the private sector, the Ministry of Agri, and if you like, the Department of Agri at the local level, is now entirely dealing with try documentation issues. So, for example, government is currently using or uh, implementing what we call the passbook method. So a farmer needs to go to MOFA office or the Department of Agriculture with your ID card. You are issued a passbook using your ID number as a code. And that is what qualifies you to be able to access fertilizer, so subsidized fertilizer. Mm. What that means overall is that somebody has to be checking to ensure that the right people are getting the right fertilizer and that also there are no seepages or slippages in terms of smuggling. Mm. So the MOFA offices and the district assemblies with the DISEC, this is security organizations, are mandated to do that. But definitely there are also funding challenges in the sense that most of the extension officers do not have the logistics to be able to adequately do this monitoring. And that has contributed in one or two slippages that have been registered. And farmers uh, express that as a source of concern. The other level has to do with the affordability of the subsidized fertilizer in general. Uh, my understanding is, is 30 70 So government pays for the 30 It's not entirely so because government in 2008, okay, subsidized fertilizer to the tune of 50%. What you are talking about has been a systematic reduction mm. of the subsidy rate. And so as we speak today, the subsidy rate now falls to about 21%. And so that is oh, why... Oh, really? That's even less than the yes, 30? Yes. And so if you go down to look at the analysis, you realize that the subsidy, the margin of subsidy has been decreasing over the years. And it is currently doing at about 21%. So what that means is that farmers are now paying a lot more. But even before but we... But how, mu how much is a bag of fertilizer? Yeah, a bag of fertilizer in the marketplace costs differently from the subsidized fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So because you've not uh, distinguished, I'll just talk about the two. Currently, at commercial rate, it ranges between 110 120 Ghana per bag. Okay. And that is for the sulfate MPK. Uh, in terms of the subsidized fertilizer, the compound fertilizer currently is sold at 89 Ghana cities. So that tells you the margin of government subsidy. Mm. And what, is the subsi what does the subsidy cater for? It, for example, caters for transportation costs. So from the point of supply to the agent and to the community level, mm. there is a cost of transportation. There's a cost of labor. And of course, there's a margin of profit for the distributors. And so what government comes to do is to say, look, I will take care of that. Mm. And then you can sell it at a lower rate okay. for farmers. So affordability has been a critical challenge because, yes, in 2008, government did well. In 2010, right up to now, the subsidy has been there, but the rate is reducing. Mm. That means that farmers have to pay a lot more. That means that farmers have to make some sacrifices by cutting down their land acreage. That means that their yeah, overall productivity is going to reduce. And that is one critical source of worry because it is going to affect government agriculture sector targets. And if we want to continue to pride ourselves as the agriculture being the mainstay of our economy, employing about 80 
percent of smallholder farmers, and especially women, you know women are predominantly in the sector, then it means we have to be doing something uh, beyond that. Mm. Education on the utilization or the application of fertilizer and overall the agronomic practices has to move in line with the subsidy so that farmers are able to maximize you know the the, the the optimum level of their of their of their mm -hmm. produce. But you know, in your report, you say that over 80 percent of the farmers are aware of this uh, fertilizer subsidy. That's correct. Uh, so I'm a bit surprised why they would also not know about the use of it. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. You realize that as far as awareness is concerned, the study has established that government has done so well. It has been able to increase awareness about the product. But the awareness has to move in tandem with the availability of the product at affordable rates so that farmers can maximize the use of it. And so that is where the critical issue is. Quite apart from that, farmer to extension ratio in the country is currently not the best. We are getting the extension agents rate reducing more and more. And so what that means is that even their availability to able to reach the numerous farmers on the ground is a big problem. So for example, you have anecdotal evidence coming from the study that women farmers indicated that look, since 2008 that we got training on how to effectively apply fertilizer. We have not had it since then. Mm. So what happens about the new approaches that are coming? And that is one of the critical challenge of funding and the extension or the district uh, educate, agriculture uh, the development units complain a lot because they don't have the logistics to be able to reach out. Yeah. How do they even monitor the private person who is selling this subsidized fertilizer if you don't have the logistics? Government came out with innovative ideas to try and use ICT so that you are able to eliminate you know, a lot of the, 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 the loopholes. Mm. But of course, then again, you need equipment. You need logistics, which is really uh, inadequate. And these are contributing in terms of affecting farmer productivity mm. and utilization. You know, it's interesting how we have Farmer's Day, which is a holiday. We don't have Manufacturer's Day. Right. We don't have uh, Services Day, if right. you like. We have all these basic issues with farming basic issues yes. and we are not addressing them yes basically the we need to go beyond the talk we need to if you look at agriculture sector plans they are very lofty very good plans on paper but when it comes to the implementation then we are found wanting in terms of resourcing you know the resourcing the staff at the basic level to be able to reach out and whether we like it or not that is the center of productivity. That is the point of focus that government need to find innovative ways. We need to find the money. We but if we boast about the, the fact that this sector, you know, is the backbone of our economy, we've said that over and over and over again, yet we don't, we don't see any proper, uh, we're not contributing to the sector in any way. We're expecting the, sec the sector to give us a lot more, but we're not investing in it. Yes. This is very basic. I don't expect us to be having these issues of fertilizer today, honestly. Yes. So one of the critical issues that then emerges, and it's a point of emphasis of this research report, is the fact that there's a need for increased investment. And that is what you are basically talking about, that we need to walk the talk. If you look at government budget estimates for 2015, government clearly indicated that it was going to import about 180,000 metric tons of fertilizer, subsidized fertilizer. As we speak now, current figures indicate 90,000. 90, what that means is that we are doing 50% at the moment. And if you go to northern Ghana, we're just coming out of our farming season. So you then ask yourself the question whether the fertilizer supply has been adequate. If you look at the government medium-term medium agriculture sector plan, it talks about the fact that it wants to increase the supply of fertilizer per acre in the country 
as we are, we are currently doing about eight, 80 kilograms, sorry, eight kilograms. Mm. Government has been able to raise that to about 20. Eight to 20. Yes. And the target is 50. But we are currently doing below half of the quantity of fertilizer that needs to be applied on one acre of farm to be able to maximize outcomes. And so what that means is that there's still a lot of, a lot of work out there and government need to find the money. Mm. It is good that government is working with the private sector, but the import guarantees creating an enabling economic space for the private sector to be able, you know, to sell fertilizer at affordable rates is the way policymakers should focus attention on. And this is what this, this research is aimed at doing, mm. to raise the issues in the public domain, to get government actors, or if you like, state actors, especially in the Ministry of Agriculture, to at least look, rethink the implementation of the uh, fertilizer subsidy program mm. in a manner that would support the smallholder farmer on the ground to increase productivity. Sure. But you also give some direct recommendations. Right. Let's uh, go through a few of those recommendations that you give. Right. Um, the recommendations are straightforward. The first point of call is for government to continue to increase investment in the agriculture sector, but more importantly, under the agriculture subsidy program, f sorry, fertilizer subsidy program. In, in your experience, you know, doing this job, do you see this as a possibility? Yes, it's a possibility because, like I stated earlier on, if you do a trend analysis of the subsidy program, you would realize that government has, over the years, proven that there's some commitment. So, for example, if you take 2008, government allocated 43,176 metric tons of fertilizer. It increased to 180,000 metric tons in 2013, and that gives us about 317% increase over the period. Mm. What did, did, is the did, challenge? Did we do better with that investment in that year? That is a good question. And so if you do an overall analysis of the sector, in terms of the crop stock sector, we did quite well because the fertilizer subsidy has led to increases in acreages. So, for example, you have farmers giving anecdotal evidence that, look, before the subsidy program, I usually got about one bag of NPK, that is the compound fertilizer, and I got about two, three bags of maize. Mm. With the coming in to effect of the subsidy program, I am now able to buy six bags, and I'm able to make 25 bags per acre. So the anecdotal evidence point directly to the fact that this is a lofty program. This is a government pro pro program that can transform agriculture, especially at the community level. But the challenges of monitoring, the challenges of lack of sustainable funding, mm. the challenges of you know, inadequate or poor quality control, the challenges that farmers face day in, day out by using the passbook to access, the challenges of smuggling. Uh -huh. the, the, the issue of smuggling, that was also very major because we subsidized. People were taking advantage of it and also, you know, reselling to other countries. Absolutely. And that is a major leakage that government have to look at. It's a drain on the Do finances. Do we still have that problem? Yes. There are anecdotal evidence. But, you know, to, for us in research, you need to be able, you know, to have data. To then quantify and say, look, over the years... Mm. This is what has been going across our boundaries. And therefore, there's the need for government to take action. But as we have it now, we have people in the neighborhood, the country's borders, farmers reporting. You know, one of the challenges farmers have, which they are bitter about, is that you take your passbook, you go to a dealer, and then the dealer tells you that, look, we don't have subsidized fertilizer. It's finished. But you can see bags of fertilizer packed in the distribution center. So they go back bitter about it. And so what is the evidence that the available fertilizer is not part of the subsidy mm. program? That's a big question. And that is why monitoring on the, on the part of government sector workers, such as the AEAs, 
such as federal officers at the district and the regional level, resourcing them to be able to monitor the depots, to be sure that what the depots or what the distribution agents say it is, is really the case mm. that there are shortages. Mm. Other than that, we are basically going to be pouring water on the rock. And that means that the agriculture sector targets that we put in place might not be achieved. Now, going back to continue with the recommendations, we also realize that another big challenge at the grassroots level had to do with inadequate sales outlets. So, for example, you have Wenko as an importer of fertilizer. Mm. It has signed up to government subsidy program. It's supposed to have agents at the community levels. So they do well to have agents at the district levels, but even some of the districts don't have. So for example, you take some deprived districts like Sola Tuna Kalama in the northern region. The sales agents until now were not there. So they needed to travel to areas like Wa to be able to purchase subsidized fertilizer, Bali mm. to purchase subsidized fertilizer. When that happens, it increases the cost. They will not be even subsidized anymore. Absolutely. You're better off buying it Absolutely. at the market price Absolutely. where you are than travel all that long distance to go and get the subsidies. I agree in total. So that is, these are the challenges farmers face. And so we are calling on government and the Ministry of Agriculture to work quite closely with the private sector to ensure that more sales distribution outlets are established, especially at the community level, so that a farmer in a community such as Pasingpe, a farmer in a community such as, you know, uh, uh, Sabunjida, should not bear the blunt of the cost of traveling about 20 kilometers, 18 kilometers, like some farmers in Tolong stated. Mm. That you go to the depot, there's fertilizer pack in the, in, sorry, in the sales agent's uh, store. They tell you the subsidized fertilizer is, is not available, or even that the commercial fertilizer, there's a shortage. So you have to ride a bicycle all the way to Tamale to be able to access or to buy fertilizer. Mm. That cost is putting pressure on farmers to want to reduce the quantum of their land acreages. Uh, I've got Shadow who is watching us from Dabois in the western region who says uh, fertilizers are uh, still sell on the market between 100 and 150 cities. Yeah. I work with over 2,500 cocoa farmers in the Wasa East District and it's hell for them. Uh, this is from Shadow. Right. So Shadow, thanks. I thank Shadow so much for this contribution. It raises the issues that we are talking about. That on the ground the situation is quite different. Mm. The situation needs some policy action. The situation needs drastic action, as we would want to put it. And so another area of the recommendation that I want to talk about has to do with the value of agronomic education. The issue of AEAs has already been emphasized. As you travel more and more to the communities, and especially to deprived districts, the availability of extension offices decreases. To the extent that overall as a country, we are doing, we are currently doing with about one extension farmer to about 1,500, hmm. one extension officer to about 1,500 farmers. And if you even travel more o Over the what north, period? Over what period? I mean, you're supposed to be monitoring them over a certain period. Yes, over the farming period. Because you're supposed to be visiting farmers, at look, uh, uh, monitoring their farms, finding out some what are their challenges, and then educating them on new agronomic practices with a view to try to increase the quantum of harvest per hectare mm. of farm. And so once that is not done, farmers are engaged, for example, in poor application of pesticides, in poor application of even the subsidized fertilizer we are talking about, because a critical challenge that the farmers who have gotten education stay is that you don't broadcast the fertilizer. In other words, you don't just throw fertilizer at the base of the crops. Mm. They have been taught to try to excavate, make some small holes, then you drop the fertilizer inside so that the, rain wa the, the, the rains don't wash the fertilizer off. And that is the importance of the training on agronomic practices that farmers need to continuously benefit. Beyond this, a fundamental challenge 
has to do with even gender issues. Gender. Gender. Men, women. Men, women. So as you, uh, the research points to the fact that men have more information in terms of agronomic practices compared to women. Really? How? But women constitute about 80% of smallholder farmers in the agriculture sector. The reason is that they have to contend with other activities. And mm. we also know we are in a paternal society. Even information sometimes regarding meetings on these trainings, they don't get it. So is it the fact that they are discriminated against or their attention is so divided they may not have the time to appear in the places where the education is taking place? To a very large extent, I would say they are largely discriminated. Because even if they are engaged in other things, we need to target them. The point of emphasis is that farmers have to be targeted because of their important role in smallholder agriculture. And more especially, the woman farmer has to be targeted with the same information that we give to men. Mm. So for example, if you go to the northern region, from the study areas that we have done, even though awareness level is high, it's high among men. So for example, the northern region, we have about 37% of women being aware. And we have about 90 or over 90% 90 of men being aware of the subsidy program and agronomic practices. The situation has to change. And we are saying that to be able to change that, you need to improve upon the availability, the distribution of agricultural extension agents. Mm. Because they are the primary focus. I, I, you know, when you raised the issue, I had a question. Yeah. What's the motivation for that one extension officer to over 1,000 uh, farmers? What's the motivation? You know, the, the motivation is that they don't, the, the issue is that they don't, they, they, they are not available. We have agricultural colleges that are training people who are supposed to come and fit into this place. They come out, they are not given ready employment. One would have even thought that district assemblies can take up the challenge of supporting citizens from the districts to go for this training and they are then tied up to come back to the district assemblies to serve. I agree. As we go further in this regard, development organizations and NGOs have resorted to trying to train what we call community volunteers. So for example, you take San Ghana working in the Eastern Corridor area, Salaga, Bimbila, Ketekrachi. We train extension volunteers. In other words, we have to create an enabling environment, get the MUFA officers or SARI to come and train our volunteers on new methodologies, new techniques to try to improve upon production. What's in it for you? Because you know, you're an, you're an NGO, but you're a private organization. Exactly. Because we are working with the focus to try to combat poverty in our operational areas. And therefore, the, the motivation is to try to increase farmer yield. And so when farm yields are increased, like we have the evidence here in terms of their increment in incomes, they are able to now live in corrugated zinc houses. Mm. And that is one incentive for organization and development organizations wanting to get engaged in that. I remember in one of the research, one woman just pointed to their house and said, my, my son, we used to live in touch houses with our continuous ability to afford or to provide subsidized fertilizer. Our land acreage and productivity has increased. And we're able to buy this zinc and to roof this house. Another woman noted that, look, we are now able, with the advent of the subsidized fertilizer, and that is for those who have access it, to be able to increase our income. We can pay for our children's school fees. We can take care of our, our medical bills to some extent. So the benefits have been established. That is the point I'm making. And therefore, government need to look at the program, mm. look at some of the recommendations that we are talking about. So for example, we are calling on government further to improve upon the capacity of the district agriculture units to be able to monitor, to be able, to, they, should be, they, should be, they should be mobile. As we speak now, what we found is that some districts are doing, district assemblies are doing quite well. They support 
some of the Greek officers with four per week. Mm. But a large majority of the districts say they don't have the resources. And that continues to create a big problem. Another recommendation of emphasis has to do with creating opportunities for farmers to get fertilizer right on time. Getting fertilizer at the right time is a sure guarantee to trying to increase farmer productivity or yield. Therefore, we recommend that government take steps to ensure fertilizers are released at the beginning of the farming season. So the fact that fertilizer is a seasonal crop also imposes a responsibility on government to try to start the process of procurement, the process of importing fertilizer, the process of getting guarantees to importers such as Rienko, Yara, and others, so that they kickstart the process of importation in the right time. Mm. And so, by the time farmers are getting ready and preparing their lands, the fertilizer is available at the sales uh, stores, and then they can access yeah. it. Yeah, what, what's this the point when they can only have access to the fertilizer when they, when they are uh, about... Uh, uh, when the farm is already yielded or, you know, That's I don't know, whatever point. term. And you know, another challenge has to even do with climate change. Most of us believe that climate change is here with us. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you go to northern Ghana, the times farmers are ex expecting the rains, the rains either don't fall, or at the time they don't expect the rains, the rains fall. In other words, the earlier the rains come, farmers have no option than to get ready and go to the farm. And so if fertilizer is not available around that time, that imposes a challenge. Mm. Uh, let, let me read a couple of the messages that have come through. Uh, we're getting to the close of our conversation on this one. This one says, good morning, Mama V. For propaganda reasons, the government attempts to do things on a gangantuan scale, something to represent something, uh, and the whole program ends up falling apart because then problems of proper research and development, effective supervision, evaluation, and quality control sets in. The principle of starting on a small scale and expanding steadily and progressively should be adopted. Programs like these are meant to cushion our uh, struggles not to establish dependency and let down. It's from MD Kwesi Ima, my friend in Akosombo, sending that message. Right. Uh, this one says, this is Peter from Bali District. He says, I don't know whether your research covers Bali District because anything in Bali depends on the political party you belong to. If you are not in the same party with the one in charge, uh, master, forget it. Uh, you would rather waste money than buying in the market, and in the end, you will not get anything. Farmers followed the so-called subsidy fertilizer, and in the end, wasted their money. So you didn't include your name. Okay, I think you did. Peter from Bali. Uh, this one says, I'm Israel, a Greek extension agent working two years now without motorbike. I find it difficult getting to the farmers. All right, Israel, even though you didn't say where you work, I think if you can quickly just follow up where, which districts where, which area, which uh, parts of the country, that would be good as well. Uh, this from Dio, uh, Dioan Jipo in Wa uh, Busi says it's a nice program and may the government have a listening ear to some of the, the, these facts that are discussed. I graduated 2012 as an agri engineer. Uh, Mm -hmm. Wasting in, in my district because no job, no resources, so as many in Ghana. Wow. Dio, thank you very much for the message, even though you don't have a job now. Uh, we pray that, you know, something will come your way. Mm -hmm. You can even take up farming yourself. You can yeah. start something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So any comments, you know, on, are you in Bali? Did you experience that? Yeah, that, that's also an operational area in Busie as the... The oh, so it's not Busi. Yeah, it's Busi. <laughs> you know, okay. we, 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 we have been working in all those areas. As a matter of fact, that area was one of the, the sample areas for this research. Okay. It covered uh, all those areas. And basically, I mean, they are highlighting the fundamental points that we are making, which is government needs to be a little bit proactive. This extension agent issue has been critical. Mm. You know, one finds it difficult to appreciate that we have agriculture colleges 
So, for example, you go to northern Ghana, we have the Damango Agri College, training college. Trainees come out, and they're apparently wasted. So, for example, if even government is not employing, the question that I ask is, is it not possible for district assemblies to map up strategies together with a district agriculture offices or units to be able to pick or employ a good number of citizens coming from the district mm. who have been trained. So for example, we could place them on allowances, give them the training. If we may have to get bicycles for them, we can even make them resident in the communities. Because mm -hmm. you see, somebody just sent you a message that he did agricultural engineering. That is a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. He says he's wasting in the house. We can, these should create employment opportunities for the teeming youth that we have that are apparently you know, unemployed. Government is running modules under the youth employment program. To what extent do we prioritize this issue? And you remember when we started, we were talking about priority. Mm. Agriculture is the mainstay of our economy. So to what extent, what is the level of investment? You know Ghana signed up to the Maputo Declaration and the CAD, which emphasizes that and joins governments to spend at least 10% of their gross domestic product investing that in the agriculture sector. In return, those investments should be able to yield about 6% growth in the agriculture sector. Mm. And so if you are investing that well in the agriculture sector, and especially looking at areas such as the agriculture subsidy program, this program that we have put in place, then we should be matching or we should be rising in terms of agricultural productivity, which is co contributing to about 6% growth. As we speak now, in 2015, the growth stood at about 0 0.04. That was rather, sorry, uh, 2014. And that but is, is, that's also understandable because 2014 is the year that... 2014, 2015. 2014 yes. is the year that the, we didn't have any uh, subsidized yes. uh, fertilizers. <laughs> so that, 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 that then emphasizes the point yeah. of the important place of the subsidy program mm -hmm. as we discussed. Sure. And so I just want to add quickly that as we even go into the monitoring, as government continues to strengthen that, provide motorbikes for eight years, provide fuel for their movement, improve upon the maintenance of their vehicles, introduce ICT. If we introduce ICT into the monitoring of the subsidy program, we would drastically reduce the loopholes and the leakages mm -hmm. that are in the system. Okay. We need to look at that. Sure. The supply chain is very important. Okay. Uh, uh, Israel, who says he's an agric extension agent, uh, you're giving me more information. You work with uh, the Kutu South Municipal Assembly Department of Agric, mm -hmm. Denu in the Volta region. Thanks, Israel, yeah. uh, for following through this conversation. Finally, uh, you know, it's good. You do a lot of work. Send Ghana, I must commend you. Thank you. You put together that this document thank you what do you hope can be achieved because you know sometimes fine work is done mm -hmm. we would come back many years and refer to this and say oh we knew about all these challenges we even wrote about them right. it's been documented but nothing happened right so our people have said that a journey of thousand miles begins with a step we do not want to say that government is doing virtually nothing as far as the subsidy program is concerned. No. The findings show that there is some good work on the ground. Mm. But the good work stops at a certain point. The good work is bedeviled with a number of challenges. And once government addresses that and remains consistent with, its, with the MetaSIP program, wherein it says that is going to work systematically and increase the quantum of fertilizer per acre to about 50 kg kilograms. That is lofty. That will increase food productivity. What government need to do is to be able to improve upon the supply chain. 
import fertilizer right on time, what that means is the government must make money available mm. and ensure that farmers, sorry, the importers are given adequate guarantees at the right time. So they import the fertilizer at the right time. Farmers get the fertilizer at the community level at the right time. Get agronomic practices. AEAs has to be, have to be functional. Once we get that working, we are going to improve productivity. What are we going to do? We will continue to hold policy dialogues from the district, regional, and national level. And this national level will bring key state actors to deliberate on these issues. And our development partners are key part of these discussions because they are also investing in the agriculture sector. And all that will increase pressure on government, at least to look at the situation. You see, the more and more civil society organizations or independent entities like us get involved in policy research, give government feedback, mirror what community people say, it increases their responsiveness mm. because they get a better understanding of what is coming from the ground, sure. and that helps. I must say the ministry is listening to us because we work with them to generate this, and we are only hoping that parliament and other government actors would you know, respond mm. to the findings of the research. Sure. I must say that, you know, as a Ghanaian today, honestly, it is work by uh, organizations such as yours right. that also give us hope, right. you know, because right. otherwise then everybody would just simply right. give up because nothing happens in the end. Right. But I'm grateful for your time. Uh, right. John Inko is programs officer with Sand Ghana, also a lead researcher in the conversation that we've been having on uh, making fertilizer subsidy helpful to small holder farmers thank you very much for all the messages that you also sent through stay with us we've still got a lot more coming your way we've got am talk a big conversation pnc uh, silently uh, held i think that days before that nobody really had a lot of things about it uh, but they went to congress they've got new national executives in place uh, we're going to have a conversation on that as well and other topical issues remember that the power ministry has just issued a statement uh, uh, if you like saying all the things that we've heard on social media over the weekend concerning the ameri uh, deal is false. We've got details on that coming your way on AM Talk, so stay with us. Thank you very much, John, for your time. Let me also say thank you very much to Joy uh, TV, but more especially to acknowledge our funders, uh, Care Denmark funded and supported mm. this project. We do not take that for granted. We want to continue, you know, to put that on record and to continuously depend on them for their general support okay. so that we can continue to do the work that they are praising <laughs> us for. I think I'll carry your uh, kind words to my country director. <laughs> my program director will get to hear that. We are All grateful right. for the encouragement. Yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah. Please stay with us. This yeah. is the AM Show.